Amen. Hallelujah. Let's rejoice. Our God is the God of the mountains. Hallelujah. There is a mountain.
It's so wonderful this morning that we can be found in the house of the Lord. Shall we stand and let's declare together, I am deeply loved, greatly blessed, and highly favored. Look at somebody and say, you are deeply loved, greatly blessed, and highly favored. We are deeply loved, greatly blessed, and highly favored. Three things, love God, love people, love life. You can never go wrong. If you choose to, love God, love people, love life. Give the Lord a hand. Thank you, worship team. A couple of weeks from now, the church, locally as well as worldwide, will be celebrating Easter. When I first watched The Passion of Christ, that which stirred within my spirit is this, obedience unto death. You know, it was not easy. We often read it in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John concerning the death of Christ, but because it's only words. However, in the passions of the Christ, you see that it is being played out step by step, you know, moment by moment. It's so heart-wrenching, but then at the end of the day, Christ was resurrected and ascended to heaven. To God be the glory. I want to focus this morning particularly preparing our hearts for the coming Easter season. At the same time, you know, check our hearts and see concerning the key word that is obedience. So the focus this morning, the message is about the obedience of Christ, okay? Let's turn to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love... If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affections and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambitions or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider himself robbery to be equal with God, but make himself of no reputation, taking the form of a born servant, coming in the likeness of man, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, and that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now, here we have got from verse 5 onwards all the way to verse 11, telling us that Jesus, he obeyed, our Lord Jesus, he obey, you know, God and his instruction, being obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. That means to say, Christ came with one purpose only, to face the cross and to lay down his life for the cross, you know? And then at the same time, to trust God that the rest, God will take care. And God did not fail the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that, you know, he was highly exalted and given him the name which is above every other name. In three spheres, one, it says in heaven, two, earth, three, under the earth. At the very mention of his name, every knee should bow, every tongue confess. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay? So the obedience of Christ, you know, it is being divinely ordained. At the same time, God used his death to achieve only one thing. That we have to look at the book of Romans. Let's look at Romans chapter 5. The death of Christ basically is more than just he died for the sins of the world and for all the sinners. But God has got a plan. God has a purpose, okay? In Romans chapter 5 verse 12, Therefore, just as though one man's sin entered the world and death through sin, and does death spread to all men because all sin? For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Wow. Paul seems to be able to understand 
The very act of Christ died on the cross is more than just symbolical. It has got that theological significance. At the same time, how it will impact, you know, the entire universal, especially human race, okay? Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over to those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgressions of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Adam's sin caused the entire world to fall into sin. But Christ, you know, he gave his life and through the gift of grace of the one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, it is made available to all all nationality, all races, all age group, you know, every single one can receive this free gift. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. People without Christ, because of their sin, they live in condemnation night and day. However, but the free gifts which came from many offenses resulted in justification. That is, Christ gave us, hallelujah, His life to justify us, to forgive us, and to set us free and to redeem us from the curse of the law. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace. The grace of God is not just, you know, the grace of God, but rather the abundance grace. No matter how, how deep you're living in sin, and how changed, you know, or you've been uh, tied up and uh, dominated by sin. The grace of God is able to reach out to you abundantly. Hallelujah. Amen. And save you. For if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Verse 18, therefore, as though one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. When God looked at you, what you were, you were sinless. But when God looked at you now, you have received the Lord Jesus into your life because of what He has done on the cross, the Bible said. For as by one man's disobedience, many will make sinners. Also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. How many of us, we know that we are made righteous because of the Lord Jesus Christ going to see your hand. Amen. Come on, let's just give the Lord a hand. Let's thank Him for His abundant grace. Amen. We sing about the amazing grace, don't we? But the Bible here in Romans chapter 5 talks about the abundance grace. So the amazing grace is not just once only in your lifetime. So many of us, we attribute to, you know, when we accepted Jesus, the amazing grace of God just came to our hearts, our life, and caused us to be so alive. And it was just amazing. But it should not be just one-time experience. The Bible tells us that it is the abundance grace of God. Abundance grace of God. Look at somebody and say, abundant grace of God. Abundance grace of God. Abundance grace of God that causes you to be justified. Meaning to say your sins are forgiven, okay? And you have made right with God. And that you carry that gift of righteousness that He has imputed. He put it there. Amen? He put it there, imputed. We don't deserve it. But because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. So, here in verse 18, one more time. Therefore, as though one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justifications of life. Hallelujah. I'm thankful. I'm grateful. Not only my sins are forgiven, I'm healed. Not only I'm healed, but at the same time, you know, I'm blessed. And not only I'm blessed, I know I have the favor of God. Hallelujah. All this while, from day one when I accepted Christ, my life was bundled up with idol worship. Young as I was, even in the secondary school. I was accompanying my family members. They go to the temples. They go to the shrine. They go to the medium. And then to, you know, uh, consult help. At the same time, ask for healing. At the same time, ask for lucky numbers so that they can strike lottery and so on and so forth. 
You know, my life was literally bundled up. So I know what it means to be bound by idol worship. But oh, praise God, the day when I was set free, hallelujah, I can truly sense that I am accepted 100% by God the Father. Amen. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, Adam was the one that brought sin into the world. Because of his disobedience, many were made sinners. Also by one man's obedience, Christ's obedience, many will be made righteous. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now in verse 20, moreover, the law entered the offense might abound. But where sins abound, grace abound much more. Yes, the Bible tells us that law enter that the offense might abound. Sometimes we look at the evil that is around us. It was very discouraging to see that nowadays, when you think about the grace of God, when you think about the goodness of God, you know, the Bible tells us, honour our parents, honour our father and mother. Some worse, they left their parents, you know, in this general hospital. They don't even come back to visit. They leave it to the government, do or die with their parents. But the Bible, time and again, tells us this one thing, that where sin abound, the wickedness that is going around us, not just about honouring parents, but at the same time, you know, rape cases, corruptions, and also scam. So many reports about how senior citizens being cheated, and the scammer don't have any conscience. They don't have any conscience at all. No doubt the news is being published over and over again. People are reminded, but somehow they are still victims. And the worst thing is about shooting, you know, Especially in San Francisco recently, there was this, you know, shooting case as well as in LA. The lawlessness, how the people can go into the mall or the department store. And it seems, I hope I read it correctly, it seems whatever goods that they rob, if it is less than $800, they don't need to face the music. Can I put it that way? You know, uh, as long as it's below 800 So how do you expect the retail business they're supposed to carry on? Point is, Lawlessness, but the Bible tells us lawlessness is abound. But the Bible is telling us the grace of God continues to abound. Where sins abound, grace abound even much more. So sometimes we think about evangelism. How are we going to reach out to these people? How are we going to reach out to these different strata in our society? Some of them, you know, the decay is so great in family, in marriages, in working places, the decay, you know, and how, and even to reach out to the youth and the youngster. Sometimes, you know, with the handphone that they have, it has corrupted their mind, their soul, their spirit. But the Bible tells us this one thing, the death of Christ will never ever be in vain. Where sins abound, grace abound even more. Hallelujah. The church can still triumphantly march forth to preach the gospel to people from all strata of society and to every nation and every kingdom and tribes. I just received news that our North Thai work, it seems that there's this influx of Miamis, you know, because uh, the Junta, they call it, tried to force some of these civilians to become soldiers, but they don't want to. So they cross over to the North Thai borders. Days are evil. Uh, days are evil. As we look around us, violence is all over. But the Bible tells us, don't stop preaching the gospel. And so we as a church, we will not stop preaching the gospel in the North Thai churches. We go there once a year and we are supporting the pastors and the works there. We then first will not stop preaching the gospel in Nepal as well. You know, uh, no matter how hard, how tough, how difficult, how challenging. Because we always believe the grace of God will abound. Bring it closer home. Sometimes do you feel apprehensive? Sometimes do you feel your situation is helpless and hopeless? You know, it's beyond you. You cannot and there's no way and you're not capable of handling. Be reminded by the scripture. It says that where sins abound, the grace, the grace here referring to the work of Christ 2,000 years ago, you know, it is still powerful. It is still able to change and transform lives and situations. Where sins abound, grace abound. Hallelujah. 
the blood of Jesus never lose its power. 21, so that as sins reign in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, hallelujah. Praise God that Christ chose to obey and die on the cross for us. The obedience of Christ is so vital as we think about the coming Good Friday and Easter, without which we will not be able to see, you know, the grace of God and experiencing the grace of God and the abounding grace of God. Christ's obedience in the scripture, basically, I can see in three phases. Even as a child, the Bible says that, you know, he chose to obey his mother and father because he was found in the temple reasoning. Can I have the picture? He was found in the temple reasoning with those, you know, religious leaders. He was so young, probably about 10 or 11, but he was able, he has got that depth, he has got the understanding, he has got the perception. You know, most of these religious leaders, their mind was trapped in the Old Testament, but he's able to tell them, you know, the new contained the old. The old is revealed in the new. Hallelujah. Amen. And he was able to explain to them the scripture. They were amazed. They were amazed concerning his understanding. They were amazed concerning his ability to interpret the scripture differently. Amazed that he's able to link the scripture, the past to the present, and the presence being reflected in the past, in the Old Testament. So he obeyed. He told his parents. The Bible says that he went back together with them. After they searched for three days, finally they found him. Okay, and then he says, don't you know that I'm here to do the will of my father? It was always very consistent, very consistent. The second picture that I can share with you is at his water baptism. You know, at his water baptism, his cousin, John the Baptist says, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not going to baptize you. No way, you know. I know that you're greater than me, even though I'm six months older than you. You know, there's no way. But you know what? He says, no, it is good that I fulfill all all the righteousness that is required by God. The Bible says that he was baptized. Immediately, there was a death that came upon him. Most importantly, it is the voice. This is my beloved son. And then the heaven opened. There was this death that came upon him. This is my beloved son in whom I am. Well, please, church, when you and I, we walk in obedience, We are walking literally under an open heaven. Amen. There is this heaven that opened above us. And God's presence keeps coming down upon us, giving us that assurance, the approval, and that He loves us as we continue to walk with Him. He will reveal to us His plan, His purpose. And this is exactly, this is exactly what the Father said to the Son. You are my beloved Son in whom I am. Well, please. So the third picture I want to share with you is concerning the obedience of Christ that is at the Garden of Gethsemane. His disciples, they were sleeping. Okay? The picture where the disciples, they were sleeping. Now, I just want to say this. There's a seasons of everything. Sometimes we are very quick to judge the people around us. It's time to pray, but that guy is sleeping. That leader is sleeping. That Departmental hate is sleeping. That cell leaders is sleeping. Well, I'm telling you that even with Jesus around, sometimes we think that with Jesus around, we're going to sit up all day. There's going to be that fire that come from heaven and the dove that's upon us that give us the fire baptism and then we can be ongoing all night. Come on. The scripture says that they were what? Sleeping. Well, Jesus was praying. Every hourly, the Lord will go back to them and says, wake up. Why don't you tarry with me one hour? The Lord prayed all night. Every hourly he went, he saw them sleeping, 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 continue to sleep. But that doesn't mean to say that that is final. On the day of Pentecost, in the absence of their master, they excel. You know, sometimes God can bring us to a situation whereby we discover our weakness. Then only we are able to bounce back. So don't judge the people around us. You know, and saying that that guy hopeless, always sleep, never pray, never read the Bible. You never know. You mind your own business. You do what God wants you to do. And you be an example and inspiration. Hallelujah. And be an encouragement. Okay? So here we have, they were sleeping, but quietly. The Lord Jesus was praying. The next picture. He says this, the most powerful, powerful statement in the Bible. 
not my will, but thy will be done. Hallelujah. You know, he prayed, let this cup be passed away from me. It is not something that he wants to go and to be nailed on the cross. Humanly speaking, because Jesus is fully God, he is also fully human. Every part, every iota, every cell, every blood vessel, every part of him recoil. The very thought of will be crucified on the cross. It's going to be, you know, beyond what his physical body could bear. No doubt, he was the son of God. I happened to bump into these pictures whereby Changi Prison, they show you the interior part of prison. It's very small. It has got a little spot divided, no door. They expect one prisoner, if not two or three, to be found inside, male, okay? And then they have got this squat toilet. Next to it, then on the floor, they put mattress for you. Everything is pretty clean. But, you know, it's the kind of a... It's worse than minimalism. It is very bare, completely, you know? You, you have got nothing, but it's just the basic necessity. Then the other picture that I saw at Changi uh, Prison was the guy that got the caning. You know, they put some kind of a padding on the buttock and then they used the cane. Whoa! It seems that a person probably could withstand only nine and not beyond that. So sometimes they have to stop at seven or eight. Even one whip itself is enough to send the entire person shaking with electricity, you know, cold sweat, and it will take a while to recover and receive the second caning. And yet, Christ, the Bible tells us, 39 stripes, you know, the whip, cats of nine tail or whatever, you know. So he paid the price. The Lord Jesus, he paid the price, and consistently from a child to an adult, and then to the point of crucifixion, okay, we see that the whip is not enough. He will be crucified. And it is a criminal death. You will get to hear more about it probably on Easter Sunday morning. Uh, but go ahead. I just want to create a bit of suspense because sometimes we just don't really get into the part concerning the crucifixion of Christ. We read epistles, we read Psalm, we read Proverbs, we read, you know, the first part of the Bible, Genesis and all that. Maybe this season is good that you find out for yourself. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Just turn to the almost towards the last few chapters of each gospel and go through many, many times and see what he has gone through for you and me. Amen. So the Bible tells us that Christ paid a price, obedient even unto death. Well, I'm sure all of us, we know about that, more or less. But do you know the expectation of Paul as a pastor? How he would like to translate this obedience of Christ into the everyday living and operations of the New Testament congregation? It's more than just a sentiment of Christ carried the cross and then, you know, walked through the 14 stations and then after that, uh, he was nailed to the cross. After that, he died and resurrected. It's more than that. It's about the obedience of Christ. It's about us. We have been saved, justified, made righteous. How shall we live our life? It's interesting to look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love in Christ, any fellowship of the Spirit in Christ, any affection, any mercy, Paul said, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife, selfish ambitions are conceived. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Paul is saying that my joy being your pastor is this. It's not just receiving a gift of appreciation for Pastor's Day. The month of October is always called the Pastor's Month. Okay? And that's where churches all over the world, they take the month of October to appreciate the pastor. Uh, but that's how all the pastors in the world, they were appreciated, you know, because as churches, they were urged to celebrate, set aside that month for Pastor's Day. So pastors will get all the appreciations and all the thank you notes, as well as chocolates, as gifts. If not, some will take the pastors out for a meal, you know, a fancy restaurant. And then what else? There are those who are more generous and especially 
according to the ability, the Pope people buy an expensive gift for the pastors and all that. Fine, well. But you know what? Paul is saying that, hey, Philippians, I'm the one that pioneered you. I'm the one that passed over you. I'm the one that passed you over to other lay leaders. As your pastor, you know, I think about the obedience of Christ should be translated in our everyday living. Consolation, comfort, fellowship, affection, mercy. I'm looking for all this, much more than a fancy restaurant meal, much more than a gift. That which make me, Paul, encourage, that which make me, Paul, feel comforted, sense that love of the congregation, that which made me feel that there is truly this fellowship. Sometimes people say, let's have fellowship. You know, from fellowship, they end up in gossip. Uh, not fellowship, but gossip, okay? And they talk about this, 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 this. But Paul t- talked about the fellowship of the Spirit, and they're able to edify me, strengthen me, encourage me, feel uplifted, and knowing that God is doing something in our midst. And then affection, mercy, and joy. Paul says, only one thing, be like-minded. Meaning to say, meaning to say, you know, that the death of Christ, because of his obedience, should gel all of us together. How does that work out? Paul make it very clear. Being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. He is referring to the way Christ loved us. Because verse 5, just now, it talks about, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now let's go to verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambitions or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Always think about others better than you, and not think that I'm better than you. So what, you know, why are you talking to me like this? Uh, You think that I'm your servant? Exactly. The Bible tells us, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Later on somewhere, it says that you and I, we are to serve one another like a bond servant. You know, think of others better than yourself. Wow, Paul is looking for all these characteristics, all these fruits among his congregation. He wasn't looking out for a thank you card or maybe a bar of chocolate to appreciate him or maybe a fanciful restaurant. Nothing of that sort. But he's looking for fruits, okay? Fruits that bear forth because of the obedience of Christ. Now, verse 12. Now, let's go to verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, now much more in my absence. Hmm. Not just in my presence only. When I'm around, you do it. In my absence, you've got to continue to practice concerning the obedience of Christ, concerning how Christ died to himself, having this same kind of a mindset. Then it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The book of Ephesians tells us that the gift of eternal life is a gift, not by work. It's a gift. But once we are born again, we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. James chapter 2, verse 26. It says that for as the body without the spirit is dead, how dead can a body be without the spirit? We have conducted enough funerals to know that when a person's spirit departed, the person is really like sleeping dead. There's no way for the person to blink his eyes when you knock at the coffin. It's really dead. Now, I also discovered this one thing over the years after I conducted so many funerals. Okay? I realized this one thing. Those who are dead in Christ, they're very beautiful. No, I'm not making flippant statement. I don't mean that. As they lie in the coffin, whether they are 40 years old, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, or even 80 over. You know why? All the lines are gone. Somehow their face is a bit relaxed. It's like, what the Bible says, sleeping. Okay? Sleeping. So the Bible tells us that in James chapter 2, verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, but the person, no matter how beautifully laid down in the coffin, but it's dead. Dead means it's dead. Over. The earthly life is over. Okay? So faith without work is dead also. 
We believe Christ died for our sins. We believe Christ suffered for our sins. We believe Christ on the third day He rose again. But if we don't practice the obedience of Christ in our midst, the Bible says that, so faith without work is dead also. What is this obedience of Christ? Well, Paul make it very plain. It says that, You are to do this one thing. Have the mind of Christ. Let's go to verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which also in Christ Jesus. It's scriptural. It is biblical. It is Christ-like to have that kind of a mindset. And that you choose this one thing, obedient. Obedient to the point of death. Verse 7. He make himself of no reputation, taking the form of a born servant, coming in the likeness of men. Wow. And became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. He wanted to do God's will, and he wanted to do God's will completely, totally. And while he was on earth, he just wanted to do that. Amen. And he finished that. When he was on the cross, this is what he says. It is finished. He told the Father. Okay. It is finished. So, we need to have this mindset, okay? Work out our own salvation with fear and trembling in verse 12. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Dying to ourselves, the Bible says that it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Dying to self. The more we die to self, the more He will resurrect. You know, He will resurrect within us. You know that your spirit is being quickened. You learn to forgive. You learn to move on. You learn to love. You learn to pray. You learn to reach out. You learn to do what God wants you to do. And you're alive in Christ. Otherwise, faith without work is dead. You are just a walking corpse. Walking death. Now, verse 14, He takes His congregation from verse 1, he told them, my expectation is this, consolation, okay, comfort, fellowship, affection, mercy, joy is this, that you live peacefully among yourself, esteem each other better than yourself, okay? Look not your own interests only, but also for the interests of others. Then he take them to this lofty theology concerning how Christ died on the cross, to the obedience of death, to the point whereby every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord, Heaven, earth, and beneath the earth. And then he takes them back to verse 12. He says that, do this. Oh, come on, do this. Work out your salvation with own fear and trembling. Verse 14, listen, it is an everyday thing. Check yourself and see, okay? Are you allowing the obedience of Christ, that attitude, you know, that mindset to permeate and to practice, you know, in your everyday life? He says, do all things without complaining and disputing. Uh Uh-oh. Do all things without complaining and disputing. I'm one of those that guilty of complaining. I do. But over the years, I've learned not to. Over the years, I've complained less and less and less and less. And by now, very much less. Sometimes I caught myself complaining. I said, stop it. Uh, I don't need somebody to tell me. I know that it's just... You know, God is not pleased if I complain, okay? Do all things without complaining. All things. Hey, all things. All things means what? All things means at home. All things means in the office. All things means in the church. All things means in the different church department while you are serving. Sometimes we have this idea, you know, that we want to throw in the tower because so-and-so is like this, so-and-so is like that. And, you know, we have so much to complain. But Paul is telling us that we are one body. Okay, we have been redeemed by his obedience of death. And you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. What a description. I think this is very appropriate, these adjectives. Okay, crooked and perverse generation. We live in a crooked and perverse generation. I don't know whether you come across this piece of news. It's very dark. Very scary too. This couple down south, young couples, they've got two wonderful boys. 
But these two boys, they are acute ADHD. The wife was really handling the two boys. Eventually, the situation was so bad, the father, the young father, took the two boys. I think already, already they are about six, seven, eight, the age. Somewhere to a, likened onto a botanical garden. And it has got a monsoon drain. Monsoon drain underneath, somewhere. And took them there. The boys follow because the father brought them, you know? And the next thing was, it was discovered later on, two cops lie in that monsoon drain. The father went to report and said the son was kidnapped and da, 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 da. Somehow, his words just not consistent. Of course, the police go and check. And you know, Singapore police, they are very efficient. And soon, they are able to detect that this is a makeup story. So what is the actual story? Because the young father couldn't take the stress of looking after two ADHD together with the young wife. The father strangled both sons until they died. Can you imagine that moment? He has only a pair of hands. He has to do one at a time. What about the other one is watching, right? It wasn't with a gun, bang, bang. It was like strangle. He was caught, of course. You know, crooked and perverse generation. Even during Paul's time, such adjectives were being used. You want to know how crooked and perverse? Lock in. Check it out. In your handphone. Maybe not now, you know. The society of Roman Empire. Then you'll be able to know how crooked, how perverse. LGBT is nothing new. It was already then practiced. From the palace to the street. Okay, so crooked, perverse generation. And we live also in this crooked and perverse generation. So the Bible tells us that when we stop complaining, you know, murmuring, then we become blameless and harmless so that we can shine as lights in the world. Verse 16, Paul admonished, holding fast to the word of life. That's why you need the Word, you need the Word, you need the Word, you need to read the Word, the Word can cleanse you, you need the Word, the Word can feed you, you need the Word, the Word can enlighten you, you need the Word, the Word can give you faith, you need the Word, the Word can cause you to walk in victory and have bonus and have authority over the enemy. God only gives us one book, praise God, but He has got 66 inside. You know, if we go by the book, we will always be victorious. That's what He spoke to Joshua the commandment must not depart from your mind, from your mouth, from your doing, from your living. You want a successful life? The book. That's a bestseller. Sometimes I just browse through the TikTok and then they have this seminar, they have their conference, they promise you to live victoriously, but nothing can be like the book. You have the book, don't you? Huh? Something very interesting about myself. Okay? Okay. Uh, when I was a lot younger, I loved to collect Bibles. You won't believe it. I know you would. It's a matter of expressions. I gave God Bible, Old and New Testament, as thin as this, but not as long as this. I know that there are small print Bible as long as this. But have you ever seen Bible, three quarter of this size handphone? Old and New Testament is so small. But when you were young, you're able to read. Because when I travel, I don't want to bring those bulky, big Bible. That was before the days of handphone, you know. So I brought along a very small Bible. I started off by owning one. I think it's the Gideon where they give away, you know. Gideon, they give away blue cover, little Bible, New Testament. I think with Psalm and Proverbs at the back. Then I came across some very kind-hearted uh, nurses, matrons from our church eventually. And they say, Pastor, I know you like white color. I got white Gideon Bible. You want to know? I say, sure, you know. So I got a couple of white, small little Gideon Bible. When I travel, I take it along with me. And surprisingly, the print is pretty good, you know. It's Gideon, but the print is pretty good. Then I came across this Australian family uh, that was in the 90s, started to attend our church and all that. Then I discovered, eh, 
Oh, in Australia, their Gideon Bible is not in blue. Malaysia one is blue and white. Theirs is green and red. So without knowing, they say, Pastor, we got Gideon Bible. Do you want it? I say, huh? Red color, huh? Green color. I say, yes. So each I've got a copy. It's all like collection. But over the years, my eyesight, not that it has failed me, but it's sort of like it's understood, you know. It's a sign of maturity, like get promoted. So I'd look for big Bible, bold print, but whatever it is, church. Like it or not, you got to go for the word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceed out from the mouth of God. Of course, now with the handphone, I've got so many versions. At the same time, I can enlarge another. I can change the phone. I understand that. But don't stop. You know, church, don't stop reading the word. It is the word that gives you the cutting edge. It is the word that gives you the wisdom. It is the word that always makes you the winner. It is the word that gives you the assurance that God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Come on, let me hear a big amen. amen. Hallelujah. Now, holding fast, that's what Paul said, the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labor in vain. We are so short-sighted. We practice Christianity only on earth. Paul is saying that you are the fruits of my labors. I want to see to it that when I see the Lord Jesus in eternity, and that he will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. All these fruits are still here. Wow, his love, his concern is not just about... Hey, this week, how many attend our church? Huh? Well, 1,000. Well, 1,000. Oh, 1,000. We have never hit 1,000. Next week, how many? Oh, 1,100. Well, fantastic. Oh. The Mandarin work is growing. The Hokkien work is growing. No. He rejoiced for the fact, I'm sure, that numbers are come, people are coming to know the Lord. But more importantly, that everyone will be found, you know, at the throne of God at the end of the day, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, nor labeled in vain. Praise God. Amen. Christ, because of his 100% obedience, for by one man's obedience, many will make sinners. Adam was the one that disobeyed. But it is Christ, by one man's obedience, many of us will make what? Righteous. There's something very detrimental about the word obedience. You know, by adding the word partial. When you practice partial obedience, many of us, which we do, perhaps in some essential aspect, we don't practice partial obedience. We practice 100% obedience and we take pride for the fact. You know, I pay tithes. I never owe God anything. So you have got that 100% obedience. Month after month, year after year. Then maybe... Church attendance. Sunday, I never skip church except during COVID. I think initially all of us will not use to not attending church on Sunday yeah, because most churches were closed for about three to four months. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, is all my life, ever since I came to know the Lord at age, very young age, I attend church. And until COVID came along, so we can't meet, you know, it is mandatory, all of us, we know that we cannot meet in the public. So we stay at home and we have the Zoom meeting and all that. So we score in terms of tithing, in terms of church attendance. And some of us, we even score in terms of supporting church work. Fantastic. You know, I remember when we wanted to buy this uh, Hunza, and so some of the, some, not all, some from this uh, 26 McAllister Road, they said, Pastor, we have bought houses around McAllister Road. So, it's difficult for us to cross over to the other side of the town. You just keep one service. We will continue to support both work, McAllister as well as Hunza. Fantastic. As far as their support is concerned, it's unwavering. So when it's time to buy MMC, to expand MMC, the Hunza group, they say the same thing, a few of them. We are all now. We don't want to drive beyond Island Glades, Island Park. Could you please keep on service? And our answer is what? Yes. They are very supportive, I tell you. Church members are so supportive, huh? not just church attendance, but in terms of offering, tithing, and building fund. We have got a group of, small little group of individuals. I don't really get, get to know them, 
but they will knock on the door faithfully. During this uh, post-COVID, and they will come and they will say, Pastor, for three months, this is my tithe. I, I, I didn't spend it. I set it aside. Now that we can travel, I come to the office and pay my tithes. So they are very supportive. They give it to other pastors. I mean, when, this, when I say pastor, I, you know, they talk to other pastors, they met them. So you can score in the area of, you know, Bible reading, prayer, tithing, attendance. Perfect. 100%. So does that ease your conscience and say that I really obey God in everything? Look at what the scripture has got to say. You know, only you know there are things that God wants you to do and He's still waiting for you. Our God is ever so merciful, full of loving kindness. He is so full of long-suffering, okay? So what about other aspects that God wants you to, you know, shift gear, move into it, don't wait, and don't wait for too long. There's a man, his name is called Saul. Can I have pictures of Saul, please? But the Bible says that God chose him, and God gave him very specific instruction. He says that, go, do not spare the Amalekites, nor, you know, the men, the women, the children, the infants, the cattle, the sheep, the camels, the donkey, and so on and so forth. And kill all. He followed God's plan. He went for the battle. He won. But his men, the Bible says that, they kept the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat calves and the lambs and everything that was good. Their intention was, they don't want to destroy all this because, you know, they only despise the weak. All those, they destroy. Because with the intention, they want to offer that to God. But God is saying the good, the bad, everything destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. So sad. The key phrase, I want you to pay attention to the key phrase, the key phrase, the key phrase. What's the key phrase? First Samuel chapter 15, verse 11. I regretted that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instruction. So I have rejected him because he has rejected me. So I have rejected him. Partial obedience ended up being described as you are rejecting God's word. You and I, we must not, and be careful, not to practice partial obedience. Obey only partly. You know, so soon he was discovered, you know, and this is what he was confronted by Samuel. And Samuel said, hey, how come you didn't obey the Lord 100% now? He said, yes, I did. Then he says, hey, what about, I heard about the, 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 the bleeding of the sheep. Then he says, oh, because we want to sacrifice some of these best of the best to the Lord. But in verse 22, 1 Samuel chapter 15, he says, Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed is better than fat of the rams. For rebellion is like the sins of divination, witchcraft, idol worship. Some of us, we think that I've never involved in witchcraft before or have stopped involving in witchcraft and idol worship. But God says that partial obedience, okay, is equivalent to the sins of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Partial obedience means what? Inside, you have got that arrogance, that pride. No, I can't trust God 100%. I will do it halfway, but the other half, I'm going to trust myself to carry out. So he was doing that, okay? He rebelled against God. And the Bible tells us, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you as king. Sad, isn't it? He was chosen, handpicked, to be the king of Israel, the first king of Israel. The Bible says he was tall and he has got thick hair, very thick hair, okay? That speaks about concerning his health. He is in his prime and he is very tall and he is very muscular and he is healthy. You know, he has got everything. And was given the throne as well. Uh, but unfortunately, to his partial obedience. What about you? Do you need to check your hearts? This morning, God is speaking to you as Easter is coming closer. Good Friday is coming closer. It's not about Easter egg. It's not about bunnies. It's not about once a year festival. It's about our heart condition. Is our heart ready or not? You know? ready to practice 100%
obedience. King Saul was rejected. He lost his crown, he lost his kingdom, he lost everything. In fact, he was so convicted, he was so desperate, and to the point whereby when Prophet Samuel says, you know, to obey is better than sacrifice, he grabbed a hold of this uh, Samuel and he tore his robe. The moment when he tore his robe, verdict was given. You tore my robe. Your kingdom will be torn apart and taken away from your hand. Sad, isn't it? There is a consequence, church. I don't want to preach just to fancy you, to make you happy. But you know, Paul is telling the congregation, you know, in Philippians chapter 2 just now, he talked about Christ, his obedience unto death resulted his being what? Given the positions which is Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. It's something very weighty. It's something very serious. It's something about Christ being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Translate into, he says that he wants to see that we live our life in such a way, if Christ can choose to die to self, you and I, we can choose to die to self as well. Obey God. The Lord Jesus says this in John. He says that if you love me, you obey me, you keep my commandments. Can I have that verse, please? If you love me, you obey. We sing worship song about loving Him. And then we declare we love Him. And then we want the world to know that we love Him. The Lord says then, obey. Simple as that. Obey. Okay? Now, there is one verse that really motivates me. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19 to verse 20. How many of us want to eat the good of the land? The Bible says, if you want to eat the good of the land, if you are willing and obedient you will eat the good of the land. Wow. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Obedience will cause us to eat the good of the land. How many of us want to eat the good of the land? The blessing of God. Can I see your hand? Really? Amen. Just obey. It can be a very small thing that God wants you to do. Do it. Don't procrastinate. Don't wait. Hello. We are already into the month of much. When is Christmas? Eight months from now. Don't believe me? Usually by October, the retailers all over Penang, KL, they already put up Christmas decoration. We just had Christmas, I know. We had Christmas in the month of December, and we have this Noah's Ark as a testimony. We just had Christmas. Now Christmas is coming again. Eight months from now, it's not very far. We already gone over January and February. Don't wait. Don't procrastinate. I don't know what God is calling you to do. To forgive? Forgive. Many a times, I tell you why we can't forgive. My own experience. Because I am an individual. My mind is active. I will always remember the incident. So what I do is, I take a piece of paper. I, of course, keep my paper in P and C. I write down whatever and all that. I don't write nasty things, but I write down the incident and the lesson learned. After that, I put it in the file, I put it away. Every time when I'm reminded or whether the devil reminds me, I say it's already recorded under the blood. That's it, lesson learned. So you don't have to always rehearse in your mind. You know what I'm saying? Huh? So and so say like that. Oh, every time you rehearse in your mind, you're taking away your positive affirmations, you know, the kind of energy, and you focus on the negative. But Paul says, let this mind be in you, the mind of Christ. So you remind yourself, I already recorded, I don't need to remember. And if I do want to know the details, I can always refer that piece of paper. I learn to forgive, forget, and I move on. But that is already settled. It's in the cabinet, you know. And, and it is written not with animosity. It is not written with the ill that intention to go and spread it as in the social media and all that. It's just a, a record. Someday, when I'm strong enough, when I am ready, I will destroy that. Oh, I don't even bother when to look at it. This is one of the ways to help you so that your mind don't rehearse. The more you rehearse, the more your mind is entrenched. The more your mind is entrenched, your mind will be captivated. And then you will always... Get angry whenever that image comes into your mind. Okay? So, the Bible tells us that if we are willing and obedient, I will eat the good of the land. Hallelujah. God ever so faithful. Hallelujah. 
eat the good of the land. Amen. He wants to bless us, but we must choose to be willing and obey. Okay? There's a path that the Lord travel. It's called the path of obedience unto death. None of us will be exempted. If you and I, we are His disciples, believers, disciples, followers. If we are His believers, disciples, followers. John chapter 12, verse 24. I'm about to conclude. Listen. Truly, truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. If you're not willing to walk the path of obedience, you will always be a seed. You will always be a seed. Just a seed, that's all. You know? Five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, you'll always be a seed. Just a seed. Yes, you will occupy a chair, a seat, but you'll always be just a seat, insignificant. But if you want to move beyond that insignificant and you want to make spiritual impact, he says, if it dies, it bears much fruit. Wow. One seed can produce multitudes and multitudes of seeds and to produce harvest. That's what happened to the Lord Jesus. He took the path of death. The Bible tells us that, you know, that for as by one man disobedience, Adam, many will make sinners. But the Lord Jesus also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. We are the result because he was willing to die to self, walk the path of obedience. Hallelujah. Will you please stand? As you stand, you bow your head. I'm going to just speak heart to heart with you. Don't allow yourself to remain as a seed, especially this Easter season. Let us choose to follow Jesus. As Paul said, have this mind of Christ. Obedient unto death. To start with, within the church, People come from different backgrounds. People come from different, you know, uh, stations of life. And sometimes we rub shoulder with one another. But the Bible warns us, do not complain, do not murmur, but rather learn to esteem each other higher and then learn to die to self. Have the mind of Christ. Let nothing be done through selfish ambitions or conceit. Whether it is in the ashes department, whether it is in the children department, whether it is in the youth department, or whether it is in the Mandarin department, Hawking department, it does not matter. Prefer others better than yourself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Paul says, so that I know I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labor in vain, that whatever I preach, I teach, whatever I counsel, whatever I've imparted, it has brought forth fruits. That people are willing to follow the path of Jesus, willing to suffer a wrong than do a wrong and willing to die to self. It is not easy, but it is not impossible. How many of us were willing to walk that Path of obedience unto death. Can I see your hand? Hallelujah. Come on. Amen. What about the rest of you? Hallelujah. What about the rest of you? Lift up your hand. Father, you see hand being raised all over. Easter means, Lord, we die to self and that you may resurrect us. Your Holy Spirit will come upon us and resurrect and quicken our body, our spirit, our soul and resurrect us. Hallelujah. And that we become truly a new creature in Christ Jesus and that truly we are a child of God and we are more than conquerors. Hallelujah. That others may see Jesus in us in this crooked and perverse generation. Father, forgive for the wrong that we have done. Father, forgive, Lord, the shortcoming that we have. Father, forgive, Lord, there were times we were not Christ-like. I know you don't hold that against us. The very fact that you, you reminded us today, Lord, that there is victory ahead of us. And Lord, we choose by choice to die to self so that we can be like a seed that falls to the ground. And Lord, that we may bring forth a harvest. 
a harvest of righteousness, a harvest, hallelujah, amen. Lord, bearing forth much fruits to glorify you in every aspect. Thank you, Father, that your word is a lamp unto our feet, light unto our path. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We embrace your word. We embrace, Lord, your teaching. We embrace, Lord, whatever you have commanded us because we love you. And all that you require of us is we keep your commandments, we obey you. In Jesus' name we pray. I pray for the coming weeks, Lord, throughout this week. You will remind us, Lord, Easter is just around the corner and the path of concerning obedience unto death you have, you have laid before us. And ahead of us is victory. Victory in Christ Jesus. Victory in the Spirit. Victory in the Kingdom of God. Victory, Lord, in every aspect, Lord, that we can experience a breakthrough. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, give the Lord a hand. Amen. Amen.